we're going to start talking about psychological disorders. In this chapter, we're going to do, again, sort of a smattering of topics. And I will, as always, claim that this is a single chapter um, on a topic that you can take an entire course in. Um, abnormal psychology is an entire course on different disorders and treatments for those disorders. But also, you can get entire education, specifically getting into clinical psychology. So this is very much a crash course. And you're going to find that when we start talking about disorders, some of them only get a single slide. And some of them get acknowledged and never discussed at all. So this is meant to be a discussion of the ones that are either the most well understood, the most common, sometimes both, because we tend to study the ones that are most common, um, or the ones that fit nicely with the others that we've already talked about. So this is not meant to be a complete discussion. Um, we will start off a little bit with a discussion of what do we mean by abnormal. Um, we'll talk about some of our historical perspectives, where we started and how we got to where we are today. And then we'll start discussing diagnostics and uh, classifications of different disorders. And then we'll go into specific disorders. And the categories we're going to focus on, we'll start with anxiety disorders, I believe. Then we'll go into mood or affective disorders, uh, dissociative disorders, personality disorders, uh, somatic system disorders. That's one of those I throw in just because it's neat, not because it's common or well understood. Uh, then we'll get into neurodevelopmental disorders and schizophrenia. And all of these are sort of categories of disorders and schizophrenia gets its own because that is the disorder that we know the most about that we've studied for the longest, um, and therefore we have a lot more we can talk about. Starting off with our discussion of what does it mean to be abnormal, this is again where we have one of those disclaimers. Um, and this is something we've been discussing, I guess, on and off throughout the entire course. The fact that when we're discussing things like, oh, these are the associations, or these are the scores, this is what we see. We have to acknowledge that we're looking at the average individual. So we very rarely consider the entire scope of human possibilities for any given behavior. We typically talk about things like, this is what we tend to see. This is the average score for whatever it is we're looking at. And yeah, we might get a little bit of a range, but if we're deciding that something is normal versus abnormal, what does that mean? And this is actually something where the terminology in psychology is starting to very slowly change to the point that abnormal psychology is um, slowly, I believe, getting renamed. And of course, I always forget what they're changing the name to, but we're basically starting to see this as a discussion of disorders um, as sort of other things to mention, not so much normal versus abnormal or typical versus atypical, just an, an acknowledgement of a spectrum. And so, of course, if we're having that discussion, why do we care normal versus abnormal? Um, the reason is there's a lot of different ways to think about abnormality. And this is from one of our textbooks, not the one we're using. I like this list from one I used years ago. Um, but this is like six different ways we might conceptualize abnormal. So if we were looking at somebody giving a diagnosis and we're saying that your score is significantly different enough or it's abnormal enough to qualify for a, a diagnosis, what do we mean by that? So it could be something that's determined by that diagnostician. What values do they have? What experiences have they had? Um, so they might decide that you are abnormal enough um, to sort of meet that criteria. Obviously, somebody's opinion, somebody's personal values is not necessarily the best way to make a determination. So we're going to discard that one um, right off the bat, though we will acknowledge once again that individuals, even when interpreting diagnostics from a standardized manual, might have slight differences in how they apply those um, sort of standards just because of, again, personal experience and the way they interpret things. So individual factors still absolutely play a role. Um, we can look at cultural expectations, and this could be the culture that you've come from, the culture that you're in presently. That might be the same. It might be different cultures. This is one of the reasons that I've mentioned before that things like standardized tests, uh, we talked about this in terms of um, intelligence tests, where things like moving from Canada to the U.S., taking a test in a different uh, country than where you were taught originally can affect your scores. 
So we can definitely acknowledge that determinations of what is typical behavior versus atypical behavior will dramatically depend on where you are in that given moment. So there can be cultural differences and things like that. Um, so again, that's probably not our best uh, determination if we're trying to go for some kind of standard. Um, we'll acknowledge also that those expectations, those sort of typical behaviors in a given culture change over time, which we'll see has actually affected our diagnostic criteria because those have to change over time too. Uh, we can have some general assumptions about human nature of how people should or should not act. Again, that's gonna be subjective because different people will have different views on the nature of being human. Again, go back to our different perspectives. A humanistic psychologist has a very different perspective from a cognitive psychologist who is also very different from a behaviorist. We have all sorts of different ways of determining what's important and what's critical to human nature. So that's still not great. Uh, maybe we get into a statistical deviation from the norm. Let's remove the human aspect. Let's go with standardized tests. And we're gonna say if you are significantly different from the norm. So if you remember our sort of normal distributions, we had our central tendency, our mean, median, and mode right in the middle. And then we'd have the extremes. So very high scores and very low scores. Um, and we had looked at those when we were talking about uh, intelligence tests. We've looked at those in general back in chapter two, um, but that could be something. And usually that seems very appealing. Okay, fantastic. We have a numerical way of determining um, sort of the average and people that are significantly different from average. However, consider the fact that in that distribution, you have people who are significantly different from the average in both directions. So you can have people who score very, very high and very, very low. But typically, when we look at diagnostics and diagnostic categories, they often only care about one extreme, and the other extreme is completely ignored. So while this might be an approach that's incorporated, it isn't necessarily applied in the way that we would expect it from a more numerical uh, standpoint. So where do we actually end up being? We end up a little bit closer to a discussion of things like uh, the harmfulness or the suffering caused by a behavior, uh, the potential impairment to that person's day-to-day -day life in conjunction with how different it is from the average behavior. So almost a little bit of both five and six, but we're still in that realm of none of these are doing a fantastic job. And we're gonna keep thinking about that, acknowledging the fact that even though we have diagnostic standards, they are not something that is a perfect system and there are always going to be biases and limitations. So a lot of that, just general disclaimer, general awareness, and there are tons of discussions that go into far more detail on that, but um, I can stop on that for a moment. So if we're gonna go with something more about um, sort of the potential for harm, um, how do we decide about this? And a lot of our texts will talk about something called the three Ds, um, so we're looking at the distressing nature, the dysfunctional nature, and the deviant nature of a given individual's behavior. So distressing is, is it distressing? Is it causing stress for the individual exhibiting the behaviors or for those around them? Is it making people uncomfortable? Are they worried about their own actions? Um, the dysfunctional component is, is it violating things like social norms? Is it atypical um, going against things that we would anticipate for typical behavior? Um, and then, deviant, well, I guess, um, hmm, hmm, hmm. okay, no, I mixed up deviant and dysfunctional. I apologize. I should actually read the slides. Deviant is violating social norms. Dysfunctional is that it is not functional. It is not allowing you um, to take your place, your role within society. So it's something that's preventing you to function in a normal setting. Um, so switch those two from my initial explanation. Um, some of our texts, and again, I love pulling from multiple sources. Many, many, many of the textbooks I've used talk about these three. Some of them will also add a fourth D, which is danger. And this is not so much as it sort of making people uncomfortable, but is there a potential for physical harm? And if we have extremes for any or all of these, that's when we'd be a lot more likely to label a behavior or someone's actions as more abnormal and something that needs a diagnostic label. 
Again, this is really not something concrete that we end up looking at. And you can even think of this again as more of a spectrum. We've mentioned a lot of our different measures as being a spectrum. So personality was high versus low on some spectrum. And here we can have the same thing with deviance. Um, how extreme is it? Is it more in our um, conception of normal or typical behavior, or is it deviating from that? Is it more abnormal or atypical? Um, so this is not so much a useful diagram, but it does at least illustrate that spectrum and the fact that you might actually score, say, uh, higher on, say, one of these and then lower on the other. So yeah, maybe it's deviant, but it's not distressing to anyone. Um, that could be a situation where it's like, yeah, it's weird, but it's not causing anybody problems, so it's not really something we need to deal with. So that could be, you know, um, you have that family member who's a little bit quirky, a little bit strange, but there isn't a problem with it. So you just acknowledge the oddities and move on. Um, in that case, there might not be a drive to seek some kind of label for it. So... From all of that sort of awareness and background stuff keeping in mind, what are some of the terms that are going to be relevant to our discussions here? Um, talking about diagno uh, diagnosis is actually identifying an illness or disorder and applying a particular diagnostic label to it. So if we say that somebody has been diagnosed with depression, um, they've met the criteria, our diagnostic criteria, so that they would get that um, sort of label. We know that they have that disorder. Um, we then have etiology, which is the causation and developmental history of an illness or disorder. Basically, do we know where this came from? Um, so do we know something that maybe contributed to this? So if somebody's been diagnosed with depression, um, is it because of a single uh, episode, a, maybe a single emotional trauma? Is it from uh, maybe a childhood of exposure to smaller trauma? Um, or is it something where we can identify a biochemical imbalance and we know that it's maybe a neurotransmitter that's underexpressed? So our etiology is looking at what's causing this. And oftentimes we're not going to be able to point to a single cause. Many times we'll say, well, this is contributing. This is something that's sort of in the process of adding to this. But we very, very rarely know the whole picture. We can look at our prognosis which is our probable cause or, pro sorry, probable course of illness or disorder. I was distracted by my typo, um, of course. Um, but this is basically saying, based on the others that we've seen with a similar disorder and a similar possible etiology, um, this is what we're expecting moving forward. And this can include things like, here's how it would progress without treatment, or from our experience, here's how it would progress with this treatment. Um, or between two treatments, this is what we'd anticipate from both. So this is sort of that moving forward, what do we think is going to happen? Um, we can then also look at prevalence. And this is a report on the proportion of a population with a disorder at any given time. And there are a bunch of different ways we can report prevalence. So this could be, at this moment, what percentage of, say, Canadians have this particular diagnostic label. It could be a lifetime thing. So across their lifetime, this percentage of Canadians will qualify for this particular label. Um, it could be across a time span. In the last 10 years, this is the percentage of Canadians. So it's usually reported as either a percentage or a number, say one in a thousand, one in a hundred thousand. Those values are giving us an idea of how prevalent or how common a particular disorder is. Um, so all of these terms are things that we're going to be discussing, though not necessarily explicitly labeling moving forward. So as always, I love just having a definition slide up front so that we have that knowledge and we're all on the same page as we go forward. All right, so the history. As always, we know that our history of treatments of mental illness is not necessarily a positive one. There have been all sorts of periods in time where people have thought of very different sources contributing to abnormal behavior. Um, oftentimes it depends on the time period and the culture and especially the prevalent religion at the time. Um, those are all going to influence what people think is going on. Um, so one of these uh, gives us the demonic or demonological model where they thought that abnormal behavior was the result of more supernatural forces. Um, so they might say things like, oh, you have uh, demonic spirits in your blood. 
Um, and that would be things like bloodletting um, would be very common at this point to try and purify and uh, purge those sort of toxic spirits from your system. Um, you could also see things like trepanation, which is where they actually drill holes into the skull um, with the intention of releasing those trapped spirits. Um, as you can imagine, in a lot of these situations, um, if you're in a not super clean environment and you are repeatedly being cut to release blood or they're drilling holes into people's skulls, oftentimes these are things that would be fatal or have long-term health impacts if they survive. And in those cases, if somebody died from it, they would actually justify it as, well, they were too far gone, their possession was too extreme, and therefore, you know, by trying to cure them, we've now released them from this torment or whatever they were going to say. Um, and if it worked, if it was, say, something caused by pressure building up in the skull, and they recovered from this and it alleviated tension, well, look, this one person got better, and therefore our practice is something beneficial. Um, there's a bunch of early medical practices. Bloodletting is something that persisted into the 1800s as a very, very common practice. Um, and oftentimes it's because they didn't really approach things in an empirical manner. Um, when I do my uh, methods in psychology class, we talk about the fact that having a comparison group is really important because if you just look at um, bloodletting and you say, hey, um, this percentage of people got better and this percentage of people got uh, worse, they died because they were already really, really sick and there was nothing we could have done. Well, they're only framing it as the positives being important. But if we looked at, say, what about the people who were just left alone to, say, fight off an infection on their own, uh, that might have been a more beneficial approach. And in fact, that is what should have happened. Um, but again, if you're not comparing it, we have our own biases in the information we seek. So we can understand why something like this might have occurred. Um, as time goes on, we do start seeing more medical leaning models, stuff that is more in line with having a biological or physiological underlying influence. Things like infections, things like uh, internal imbalances. And over time, there have been cases where this has popped up on and off. Um, but this is just saying that our abnormal behavior would be the result of some kind of bodily process, whether it's a certain organ is no longer functioning the way that it's supposed to, or maybe something in our diet has led to over or under production of something. Um, all of that could be sort of folded into this. And that's when we start viewing disorders as diseases because it was a little bit easier to treat physical disease that had some kind of physical symptom uh, if somebody has a rash, you might think to treat that rash. But if somebody has a neurotransmitter imbalance, you don't see that and therefore don't think to treat it until they started framing it in that more internal um, imbalance model. So early on, when we have some of these views starting to delve into biology and biological sources, this, as I said, has times where it pops up early in history, but then would get sort of pushed back usually uh, drowned out by current switches in society at the time, um, especially religious ideas that would have sort of gone against some of these more biological and scientific approaches. Um, so you get to see it pop in and out frequently. Um, but if we go to mental illnesses as diseases, um, just like we have physical illness leading to sort of physical problems, um, we can trace this back to Hippocrates, um, there are a couple of others, I don't know if I've listed other names, but um, standard go back to the Greek philosophers. Um, but you can also get into things like uh, looking at uh, syphilis was actually one of the first big ones where they targeted, or I guess made the direct connection between a disease, something that had physical symptoms, and also tended to cause um, behavioral symptoms as well. Because in later stages, syphilis ends up affecting your brain and you get deterioration of brain matter, which can lead to um, basically psychosis. People maybe having hallucinations, um, not being able to think and communicate clearly, and eventually having sort of a deterioration of their ability to take care of themselves. Um, so when they finally linked, well, this disease eventually leads to these weird behaviors, um, they could now point to a physical cause. And eventually when we started being able to treat syphilis much, much, much later, and seeing it put a stop to some of those deteriorations, um, that just helps solidify that. Um, I already talked about bloodletting, um, so we don't need to go into that here, but this is just 
because I didn't know that I'd have this slide. Um, and I think I added it because I always talk about it. Um, but uh, we can also have, what else is important um, systematically? Uh, ooh, I think we come back to this at the very end and possibly in the next chapter too, but we can talk about the institutionalization versus deinstitutionalization swing. And this is something that um, basically we've had some shifts where over time, again, we get repetition in history, but institutionalization is a movement to relocate mentally ill individuals into asylums or institutions. Um, this isn't just mental illness. You'd also find uh, groupings for people with, say, specific diseases. Um, but it was basically a way for society to say, here are the individuals who don't fall under the normal umbrella, and therefore we're going to put them somewhere away from society. Um, and this started fairly early, back in the 15th century. It became sort of very popular and then kind of tapered out and then came popular again a couple of times throughout history. Um, but in between, we might get periods of deinstitutionalization, but it's much more of an active movement only recently. So we have a very recent uh, institutionalization push um, in the early 1900s. And then as we got into the 60s, and specifically, we'll actually get to see the development of antipsychotics. Um, that ended up being our tipping point to start deinstitutionalization. And the reason for this is our antipsychotics allowed us to treat individuals who were unable to function in society previously, especially when we start talking about schizophrenia. That's a big one here, where individuals having hallucinations who couldn't tell what is real and what is not real who had uncontrollable movements, obviously they'd have trouble functioning on their own and they could um, sort of influence the, uh, those around them. So there was a push to have them somewhere else, but with antipsychotics, they were a pill and they were something that if you took them regularly, basically eliminated a lot of the positive symptoms, the sort of outward increase in symptoms and behaviors um, that were associated with schizophrenia. So once we had reliable treatment, they're like, actually, these individuals can go back and have their normal lives. They can take on jobs. They can sort of reintegrate into their communities. So we should push for that. So deinstitutionalization is a movement to remove individuals from those asylums and institutions and start reintegrating them into their communities. Um, so this was a really, really big movement, started in the 70s and is something that's much more uh, common nowadays where if there's a way to have treatment, whether it's uh, drug treatment or a therapeutic treatment in some way or shape or form, if you can have people continue to live in their everyday environment um, and give them the support they need to do so, that's something that we're striving for. Um, so yeah, we'll end up talking a little bit more about that in treatments if we have the time. Um, we also get to come back to our vulnerability stress model or our diathesis stress model. I mentioned, because we just talked about this, the joys of spring term. Um, I mentioned there was another name and I couldn't remember what it was. Vulnerability is the other term. And I know I used it as a description as we talk about a vulnerability or a predisposition or a diathesis towards a particular disorder. Um, but yeah, it is also a proper title. And we don't need to go over this again, because again, we just did this. The joys of having sort of everyday classes is, I don't have to say, remember a couple weeks ago when we talked about this, we just did it. So this model is really important when talking about our um, sort of diagnosis. Um, so if we're looking at psychological disorders, you can talk about this model as, is there enough of a biological predisposition and an environmental effect for the two to combine and lead us to crossing that threshold to developing a disorder. And again, stressing the fact that this is a predisposition and not a deterministic relationship. Even if you have a strong biological predisposition, it does not guarantee that you will have a particular disorder. Um, it's just a likelihood, a probability. And your environment might be protective, it might increase your risk, or it might be neutral somewhere in between. Um, but all those factors need to be considered. Um, so yeah, a couple of different ways of visualizing that, but because we've done that already, we can keep moving. 